know who you are, and then figure out how that matches into the workplace that you want to be in and be bold about that, be specific about that, um, because I feel like then you get into a relationship. On this week's episode of Listen In, we're going to talk a little bit about something that we call knowing when to shift culture and when, by contrast, to let culture shift you, which I'm sure is something that's resonating for a lot of the audience right now in this uh, COVID-19, post-COVID-19 era. Um, My hope is that what we'll land upon in terms of insights are things that every CEO or entrepreneur need to know about uh, how they can adjust and pivot and redirect uh, as the consumer culture and marketing landscape around them is shifting. So uh, our guest today is an old friend, frankly, uh, named Jess Weiner. I don't mean she's old, but (laughs) she's an old friend. Uh, She's a cultural expert and the CEO of Talk to Jess. And I'm deeply honored to have her on the show after not having seen her for quite some time. So uh, welcome, Jess. Thanks, Matt. I was glad you. I glad you clarified the age part there. Yes, yes. Although I, <laughs> although it teeters on the edge of ageism, right? Like, <laughs> why, why should we care? You know. Right. Uh, exactly. And uh, so let's assume that we don't. But uh, uh, I wanted to kind of start today's show by just finding out a little bit more about who you are, and I thought part of it might be the lens all the way back to how we met, you know, taking a look at uh, um, your early background, which is where we first overlapped, um, and some of the things that you did that set the tone for where you might go in this career, which I do want to say, actually, I meant to say at the beginning, is pretty remarkable, frankly, right? Like, um, you've achieved amazing things as a self-starter, creating your own company, uh, transitioning through Uh, lots of different assignments and emphases. And that's why I thought that this would be the perfect conversation to have with you because you're a a great success story. And I think there's a lot for all of us to learn from the journey that you've taken. So where'd you you start? All right. Well, we started together. So we know each other from Penn State. I was an undergrad, I believe, when you were in grad school there. And I would say that my... um, journey away from theater because we share the theatrical background together as well. So I went to school, right, to study performing and I loved writing and producing and acting. But my activism came to life when I was a student um, at Penn State. And so what got activated literally for me was this notion of combining three things that I was really passionate about. Obviously, I loved performing and the creative arts, but I really fell in love with women's studies, cultural studies, understanding some uh, of what's happening in culture outside of the world that I grew up in. And then I loved classics. I had a classics degree as well. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about classics was the idea of healthy debate and conversation, which obviously was so seminal in, in, in classics and kind of big topics like philosophical big issues. And so all those three things, like big conversations about cultural topics in a creative way, was what I discovered to be my passion. But I don't know how the heck you make money doing that, or at least I didn't know then. You know, it wasn't like a turnkey internship I could go to or a job. And I didn't really have entrepreneur in my lexicon. I didn't really know um, what it was. But I think the theater background comes in handy because you make stuff up, right? And so we created, and and so I graduated with all these degrees, no way to really make any money in the world. And I figured out how to write grants. And I started writing grants to businesses um, because I wanted to put on plays for young people about social topics. And I got some money from a pharmaceutical company, was my first grant awardee. And, um, and what I learned from that was there were businesses that wanted and needed what I could bring them, which was cultural insights about their consumers that they couldn't get just from their research or just from their internal you know, um, groups, consumer groups. I could contextualize and translate for them what was happening in an emotional and creative way. And then I could deliver it in a way that was very different from traditional consumer insights. So it was a play or it was a dance show or it was spoken word. You know, I had all these kind of, you know, it was the nineties. I had a lot of like kind of creative um, elements that I used. And, and so what I loved about that was the marriage of everything I cared about. I sort of stumbled into figuring out a way to make money doing it. And also to work at this interesting intersection between marketing, advertising, and social change. Wow, I had no idea about so much of that. You learn so much in, uh, in, you know, reconnecting with people. And it's, uh, 
It's really interesting. It reminds me of uh, um, something that uh, I observed earlier on about people coming out of theater, which is just, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know how many people in our audience will have that background, but you also, um, you know, you learn a wide variety of skill sets and yeah. you basically are also just completely attuned to uh, delivering. Yes. You know, to, 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 and pleasing, I guess, you know, although that can be a burden as well. But, yeah. uh, you know, I've often said to um, people that come out of a theater background when they come out here to Los Angeles, where both you and I uh, live now, um, be careful about your temp jobs because every temp job that you go into is going to want to hire you because yeah. you're going to kill it. And they're going to be like, hey, why don't you uh, switch gears and just, you know, be a part of our, uh, our journey as, you know, a dental hygiene company. Right. Um, we- What's funny about that, just to just to illuminate that, my first job before I started to become an entrepreneur, I've only worked for one company before, and it was the limited or the learner at the time, which was in the mall where I where I was after college. And I was selling clothes, obviously, to young women. And to your point exactly, I was in the dressing rooms improvising with them as they were, you know, sharing things about their body image or their looks or their worries. And I would spend hours with these consumers and they would buy all this product. And then they, my, my managers, I remember them saying like, you should come and work in retail. And obviously like, I love malls and I love retail, but that wasn't my life's journey, but you're totally right. The ability for me to connect with people in a very like deep and emotional and improvisational way, like that was a huge business skill. I didn't know that at 21. And you know what that highlights for me that we're hitting on there too is that I would be willing to bet, and you don't have to cop to it either way, but I would be willing to bet from my experience that um, in a fairly objective way, you've never failed. You know what I mean? Like we we're always we always uh, uh, feel. I think people you know like us, and I I dare to say that there are some similarities between us. Um, you know, we always feel potentially fear of failure and a little bit of imposter syndrome. It's something we've talked about in previous episodes of Listen In. But the truth is that um, a lot of people who you see on a trajectory like you've had in your career have rarely, by anyone else's standards, Mm -hmm. kind of failed at anything. And I would contend that it has a lot to do with setting standards for yourself of whatever job you're in, whatever place you're in in your career, kind of in a Zen and not so Zen way being in the moment of that thing and excelling at it, but not for the, uh, you know, necessarily for the business, excelling at it for you, right? Does that ring a bell for you at all? Yeah, I think what feels good about what you're saying is I think when you're, again, coming from an artistic background, whether it's music, dance, sports, even, but any sort of like performance background, let's say, I think what clicks in for me is it, when it's showtime, when it's game time, I'm just on, right? So the I, I'm not holding, I mean, I think I'm always fearful of failure and I constantly live with imposter syndrome, regardless of what accomplishments I have in the world. I think that's a quieter voice now than it was earlier in my career, but it exists. (laughs) But I do think that for those who've had conditioning and you do, when you perform, you know, we rehearse and we rehearse, but when the lights come up and the curtains open, like you're in that moment and you're not really supposed to stop. And I think that's actually garnered really well for me in my career because I've thrown myself into situations that I had no experience in and no prior connection to But when it was go time, it was go time. And I was just able to do that. And that's a muscle, I think, that gets exercised over time. I think it was developed, like you've said, because of some of that artistic background. And I and I think that's what served me well. But I don't really know that I was knowing that when I was doing it. I think I've now looked back on it and said, wow, that skill set actually really served me, um, you know, at times where quitting just was not never an option. Yeah. I know. I remember now that there was something that I read about you. There was a time at which you, um, did you call yourself like a, a, a confidence expert or a confidence? Yeah. I've branded myself a number of ways to be really honest. over the years. I think, I think that's part of being an entrepreneur and also somebody who sells your services, like your IP is your service, right? I've, I started as a teen expert. So my my expertise and what I was talking about was about young people because I was one, it was lived experience. And I was working with a lot of young people in the early part of my career, wrote advice columns for teen magazines, and then really started looking at issues expertise, because that's what I found a lot of businesses were coming to me for. Like, yes, I work with young people, but I worked with young people again at that intersection of self-esteem, self-confidence, body image. And so the issues expertise that I developed was about confidence. And then 
I've called myself a number of things over the years, but I feel like where I've settled now feels the most right for me, which is kind of working in the area of cultural expertise. And that doesn't necessarily mean, obviously, I don't think any expert knows everything, but I've spent 25 years studying and looking at the systems and culture that create the consumer demand we see or create the advertising results we get. And I'm very fascinated with that dynamic and that relationship and changing it sometimes for the, I mean, most of the times for the better, right? I want there to be, I have an agenda to some of my, you know, to some of my work, but um, what I call it, I've had to change over the years as the industry has changed. It, it reminds me also, like, uh, would you, do you, have you found that you face, in addition to that whole issue of imposter syndrome, to the extent that anyone struggled with it, would you say that people setting out on a track like, uh, like you have, do you encounter a lot of external challenges to your expertise along the way. Like, uh, I think it's brilliant how you know that you've actually been an expert in teens and you've been an expert, as we're going to talk about, you know, in women's uh, understanding of their own bodies and their own beauty. And you've now not and you now have lumped it all together into uh, thinking about, you know, calling it being a cultural expert at each turn. Can someone on that journey anticipate that they're going to have other naysayers outside that are saying you're not an expert? Show me your credentials. Oh, well, yeah. Well, let me also say this is where I'd want to talk about the reality of sexism in most of the industries that we work mm -hmm. in. I've sat on panels with, you know, counterparts significantly less qualified and 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 less accomplished whose credentials are not questions. My, my credentials haven't been questioned as much as I think that as a woman in this space, talking about women's issues, I had a long climb. I'm not gonna say that I worked in this field in a way where everybody's arms were open. I mean, I was talking about body image 20 years ago. I helped to launch the Dove Campaign for Real Beauty in 2004, when talking about beauty and unretouched photographs and advertising was like so taboo. This was not what you aspired to be. We wanted slick and airbrushed and retouched. So, I've, I've worked in systems, I would say, that were closed to the experiences and the expertise that I could bring. And I think because I was a young woman, because I was a creative person that was kind of pulling together my own career. Yeah, it didn't fit in people's boxes. And I think that's where it's mostly been um, a challenge in the early days. But then I think when you, like everybody in all their roles, when you get a little skin in the game and you get some credentials and you you know you've worked in it. Um, I worried less about whether people thought I was an expert or not, or, you know, prescribed to my work. It was more like, this is the work I'm doing. This is the path that I'm on. Yeah. I want to ask you a little bit about the books that you've written. I don't, you know, we don't have to spend a long time on it, but I find that impressive as well. And I'm just curious, you know, what, what motivated the writing books? What uh, kind of a challenge was it? And uh, how central, like, is it as a part of the, the spine of your career? So actually, it's a great question that you're asking because it ties into the, the last part of the conversation around expertise. So I wrote my first book when I was 26 years old. So I was just out of college for about five years. And I had a TV deal to do a talk show out here in Los Angeles. And I was good enough to get the talk show, but from a marketing perspective and an advertising perspective, they didn't know how to sell me. How do you package me, right? I wasn't a mm -hmm. mom and I wasn't a wife and and I wasn't a doctor. So I didn't have my PhD. So how, you know, the way that they were looking at expertise or how to market me, um, they were struggling with, they being the network executives. And so I remember like I actually set out to write my first book to to kind of put together all of my experience in one place mm -hmm. that could synthesize why I was the voice um, that I was at that time, how I knew what I knew, even though, mind you, like Oprah has never been married, doesn't have children, certainly resonated with women who didn't look like her, but she was the exception and not the rule, right? So I was really struggling in a system of like, I'm young. I think probably the bias was more against my age than, than anything else was sort of like, how do you know what you know? Um, also, I came up in a time at that, you know, at that time having that deal where, you know, being young wasn't as revered as it is now as far, you know, we don't bat an eye if an 18 year old is launching a business or, you know, creating a campaign like we sort of revere youth in a different way now. Um, and I think then I was struggling with that. So I wrote the first book, which is called A Very Hungry Girl, to talk about my journey to this life and this work and how my personal struggles with self-esteem and my passion for creativity and starting that theater company that produced all those shows for kids on social issues. I sort of wrote that book to encapsulate. 
um, that part of my journey. And then I started to become known for that work. And I wrote advice columns for Seventeen Magazine and for some celebrity uh, websites. And so I wrote a second book, digging deeper into the body image space called Life Doesn't Begin Five Pounds From Now, which really was about the cultural conversation that women and men were having of, you know, well, my life will begin when I lose weight, when I have a job, when I'm married, when I have kids, like always putting it off in the future. So I could see some of the seeds in those books being, they were deliberate to kind of establish myself and culture. It was the way that I was branding myself as a young entrepreneur and, and, a, and a person who was kind of working at an interesting intersection of a couple of different fields. Um, and then I didn't write a book for 11 years and I'm working on a third book now, which will be a complete and different departure and is really talking about the cultural change that I've been a part of working with industries. It's a little bit more of a work and business book to kind of help share some of the, the intricate like details of how some of these changes have happened so that other people can lead that change within their businesses. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, having written two and coming up on three books, uh, from my perspective, you've written a lot of books. <laughs> but, uh, um, and I wonder, uh, as you made that uh, part of the journey, you know, you're co we've talked about you coming out of kind of a artist background and activist background, you're beginning to apply some of those skills to some really unique and entrepreneurial uh, career options. Uh, early on, you take a, a turn into writing your first book at age 26, I think you said. And, um, and then how do you make it over to um, being this seminal force in the Dove Real Beauty campaign? And tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. Well, the first book, I was really fortunate because I was um, on the Oprah show. So Oprah has a little Midas touch there. And mm -hmm. so I got to do Oprah's show, um, had a big momentum push after that, obviously. Um, so a lot of doors opened for me to be able to share my experience with young people and the social issues and cultural issues they were dealing with. And so I got a call, you know, I was writing a, I was actually writing for Mary Kay and Ashley Olson's website. I was writing an mm -hmm. advice column for girls all over the world. They obviously had a huge audience and have a huge audience, but at the time they didn't have a lot of content on their website. It was mostly a product driven site, didn't have a lot of content. This is like 2002, 2003. So pretty nascent days there. And um, so I wrote an advice column called Real Talk, Real Advice with Jess, I think is what it was called. And um, I got a call one day. We we're very popular in the UK. That was a big audience uh, domain for them as well. And I got a call from um, an agency that was working on cultivating what the Dove work was going to be. They knew they had some really interesting global research. It had to deal with teens. They don't normally talk to teens at that time. And they were trying to look for the right approach in. So by some of my work that I had done with girls around the world, I got referred to this agency. They called. And then the true story that I actually haven't shared very much is that I was very skeptical of working with brands early on. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't in vogue. It, it wasn't trusted, to be quite honest. And I thought I would lose all of my credibility if I walked in being sponsored in any way, shape or form by a soap company. I thought, you know, like what business do we have here together? And so I spent a year talking with the executives um, of that group and just trying to understand what they were trying to accomplish and ultimately really came to believe like, oh, I could, I could be of service to them. I could be of service to the girls I've been talking to. And I could make sure that this giant company with this amazing platform to reach people reach them in a way that would do no harm and in fact like really help um all of the things that i had seen prior and they've now been my partner for 16 years would you say that it also took a particularly unique and special group of executives to be able to go there with you yeah for sure i'm the 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 folks who started that campaign and the genesis of that work inside unilever and edelman and ogilvy and the, and the agencies who've worked with them they were all very um impressive in their ability to dig deeper um, around a topic that was, again, pretty early in its conversation and culture, right? We talked about beauty on and off, but this was pretty revolutionary to talk about, um, you know, the insight, this is interesting, Matt. So the insight globally was 2% of women worldwide would consider themselves beautiful. Okay, that seems horrible, right? Only 2% would actually describe themselves as beautiful. But what we asked them and what we sort of dug into more back in the day was what could change your mind? Because, OK, that's where you are now. And what was interesting was the women basically came back and said, 
don't try to change my mind. I already feel the way I feel about myself. What I want you to do is help change my daughter's mind. I don't want her to live the way I've lived, feeling the way I feel about my body or my beauty. And that was the unlock for these executives, I think, was the recognition that their consumer wanted them to do something with them, for them, in a way that they weren't prepared to do. And so what I'm grateful for, for that originating group of, of creatives and executives was the willingness to really go there and listen. Yeah. And you know what it resonated for me when you said that is something that's turning up as a theme in a lot of uh, this show listen in episodes, which is the importance of thinking about the why. Like recently now we've been talking a lot and I'm sure we're going to talk more in this conversation about core values, particularly as they apply to brands and stuff like that. But just as you said that, I realized what was happening, another way to look at and lens what was happening with those executives was you helped them to reframe the why as not about themselves, but about a higher purpose for their children and humanity and the world. And it's, you know, having that uh, lodestone or target that, uh, uh, you know, allows people to do um, amazing things, right? Well, and I'll tell you what my main work has been. Everything you said is correct. And the main work that I've had to do as an advisor and a consultant is remind them that this is not a one and done problem to solve. That you have, if you're going to start to change the way a woman feels about her body, it is not just a physical issue. Mm -hmm. It is a social issue, a political issue, an economic issue, a racial issue, a sexual orientation issue. I mean, it is layered and intersectional. And that was a conversation 16 years ago that I think, you know, most companies would absolutely shy away from having. And what I think was important is that they had the why, but they also had to recognize that they weren't going to solve that problem with a beautiful ad or a great campaign, that they had to start a conversation and really be committed to sticking it out. And that is why I think Unilever and Dove is certainly best in class for this scenario, because they have not let up in 16 years. They've stayed the course with that why. And certainly they've had missteps and ups and downs. But that relationship to me for a brand is so sacred when you're in it for the long haul. So were you calling yourself a cultural expert at this point? I don't want to harp too much on the question of what you called yourself <laughs> when, but I'm just curious, you know, because it helps us to also understand this notion that is the subject of the show, which is yeah. I, re I reach new places, I pivot, um, I, you know, I, I know when to shift or yeah. when to shift the conversation. So here, were you, as you worked with Dove, had you started to call yourself a cultural expert? No, I was focused on self-esteem and confidence for the first 10 years of my career. I think that was my issues expertise. And again, specifically on women and girls, that was a big focal point for me for the first half of my career. And that served really well, obviously, for the work we were doing with Dove. I would say the transition into cultural expertise is maybe about five or six years old for me. And that's because I think after all of the clients, now Doug was my first major client. It's actually what pivoted me from writing and creating um, my own work into working a little bit behind the scenes to help give birth and shepherd other people's work and larger platforms. And so I, I built a consulting business after Dove because of people who came to me, brands who came to me because of the Dove campaign. And that's when I realized that my interest as a human um, and as an educator was broadening. Like I absolutely love and will always be focused on women's empowerment and girls empowerment. That's a passion of mine. Um, but I started to get really curious about the intersectional lives of men and of family systems and of race and of sexual orientation and how that was playing out. So I started to broaden uh the the landscape of the issues that I started to look at. And I think also the world and the business changed in that they were also looking at those things. And so I feel like my change that organically happened for me as a person is something that, you know, is starting now to match more in what businesses need. Yeah, totally. I want to come back to uh, one thing that you said a moment ago, too, which is uh, a nice segue to uh, something that I, I've been really curious about, which is the slow pace sometimes of corporate change and brand change. Um, you know, how does that affect, uh, how did that affect you then? And and how, what have you learned over time about how to deal with that, uh, that pace when you're working on cultural change within brands? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, that's probably such a huge learning curve for me because I'm a pretty focused type A active person who um, wants to run before I walk in pretty much everything I do. And so I think I've had to learn a patience around the system, but that is actually a really important thing to mention. So I have always had a love and fascination for systems. That's the analytical part for me, the puzzle part, like how are people being motivated? What's the payoff? How do we help people pivot? Like change management is very interesting for me because I think it's just, it's what we all do as human beings. We change and we evolve. So when I started to work with businesses over long periods of time, which by the way, most of my clients, all of my clients now are multiple, multiple year relationships, like 16 the most with Dove, but nine, seven, five. So it's, I've, I've established a rapport, I think in really like understanding their culture. And then with that, I can help motivate and shift with the teams. Um, and so, you know, it's been uncomfortable sometimes to watch because there are definitely things that I would love my partners to do quicker, faster, and more boldly than they can do. Um, but I also realize at the end of the day, I'm talking to people. I'm helping people shift and change and grow. And like, that's also truthful. We don't all do that very fast sometimes. Sometimes I see executives I work with trip over the same self-fulfilling sabotage over and over and over again until they get it. it. Has nothing to do with their genius, their brilliance, their ability to produce. But I've taken a full like holistic approach to how I work with clients. And so I care a lot about the people that I partner with, not just the products that we produce. And for me, that makes the work very fulfilling. And I think it allows me to become more patient because I'm in a relationship then with somebody and I'm not coming in just for a transaction. I normally don't do project work. I'm normally like on retainer for periods of time so that I'm I'm folded in and I sit next to the brand while they work with agency partners, while they work with other you know, external um, partners. And I kind of get to be an, an advocate, an internal advocate, but I don't have to always live within their system. There, there's a lot there to unpack for uh, how to think about corporations. I also want to look at how to think about the lessons that you've learned for you personally, because I imagine a lot of viewers out there, um, you know, looking for takeaways about how they can navigate similar seas, right? So one thing that I've been, that's been percolating underneath everything that you've been saying so far is how many different opportunities you've had, but I think probably also created to some extent inside of your career. Where do you stand on the idea of knowing when to say no and knowing when to say yes? Well, that's so hard as an entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. Because we, we eat what we kill. So we're hunting all the time. And so sometimes the idea of saying no is terrifying because you don't know when your next meal is coming. You don't know where that next client is coming from. I think, um, that's still a lesson that I'm learning even right now. I mean, where we're sitting in culture right now, I'm getting, I don't know, 15 incoming calls a week with new business. That's like, I don't market for it's word of mouth referrals. And of course the entrepreneur in me, the one who loves business wants to take on everything. And, and then I have to really sit back and now develop a new set of values for myself, my own why my own North star um, about how I operate. So I think my, my meter of judging what's a good thing for me to do and what's maybe not the right thing for me to do is something I'm still learning and evolving. I do know now it's really important for me that I work with a team that is willing to risk. So we talk a lot about corporate sacrifice in the work that I do, because oftentimes I'm coming in for three reasons. I'm coming into a business because their sales have been down. They've had some PR catastrophe in the news or they have some piece of insight that they want to bring out creatively, but they're not quite sure. Like they want to, you know, it's risky for them and they want to, you know, do it right. And in any of those scenarios, what I want to know from them is that they're willing to go on the journey and they don't want me just to put a bandaid on a gaping wound because I'm not crisis comms. And I'm, you know, I don't want to come in and, and leverage my reputation of good work for a misdeed that they're not really interested in solving. So I think that's become an important barometer for me is like, what, were, what are you willing to sacrifice um, corporately, meaning just the way you've always done business or, you know, the things you were allowed to talk about or the things that you want to talk about. And I'll give you a good example for that. So Barbie is a great example of corporate sacrifice. You know, there's probably if you would have talked to the younger version of me and, and say, one day you could be invited in to talk about changing Barbie or, you know, working on Barbie. <laughs> I don't even know if I would have been interested in that because I was certain that Barbie was just bad for girls, bad for body image. You know, I had all my preconceived notions and 
when I went in to talk to Mattel about what they wanted to do with Barbie, what I realized was you had a group of incredibly smart executive women, mostly women on the team that I was working with, who understood they were at this like cultural like crossing of new moms, new values, a stellar brand with a lot of recognition, but not very current. And so going back to that systems part, that geeky part of my brain that loves to unpack the puzzle, I was like, ooh, okay, they're, they're in it to win it. They wanna make a big change. They're going to be committed to it. But would you sacrifice something that is really the problem that people can't get around with the doll, which is that she doesn't look like little kids today. And when they eventually said, and this is compressing a lot of years of these conversations, but when the team eventually said, yes, we want to modernize the way she looks and the way she relates to kids. And, you know, that representation was really going to be there. I mean, that's a sacrifice. That's a sacrifice of a seminal part of what that brand is. Like for me, that's why I love working with that team and that company, because I can dig in with that. I can, I can like go to the mat with that. It's been challenging. I mean, Barbie's a lightning rod for all kinds of conversation, but that kind of teamwork and commitment to corporate sacrifice and risk is probably what most gets me to say yes to projects now. And have you established with yourself and your team any kind of uh, process with regard to those longer range changes that allows you to regularly reflect on the successes that you've had along the way? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm constantly doing that, even subconsciously doing that, because I think, um, especially right now, if we want to take like now as a good moment to talk about what a lot of businesses are coming to me for, right, it's to talk about race issues within the business or the way they've lacked diversity in their marketing and advertising, um, or, you know, they're, they're wanting to be on the right side of this conversation and they're not quite sure how to do that. And so I've had to really assess, again, not just the corporate sacrifice, but I've had to listen into the in-between of, of their asks. Um, to also make sure that they were ready to really also do the personal work. This is like maybe the hardest part of, of what I do as a consultant in this space is because my, my goods are soft goods in a sense, right? I'm sometimes I'm a coach, sometimes I'm a cultural strategist, sometimes I'm reviewing content, but most of the time I'm actually coaching people. I'm helping people figure out their relationship to these issues. And so right now I'm dealing with a lot of leadership who are white or Caucasian or non-black and, you know, and trying to create a space for learning that is not shame and blame, but is active and introspective and it's personal and it's vulnerable. And we don't have workforce that's usually set up like that. I don't care what amazing brand you're talking about, like putting out a great marketing campaign is one thing, internal culture, um, and how people feel like when they show up at work. And that's a whole different thing. And so I'm now really interested in trying to figure out how to unlock um, some of that vulnerability in the workplace so that we could get, I think, to better creative work, not as a fix or a solve, but because it's germane to like who's in the room and who's creating it. Yeah, that's fascinating because, of course, a lot of uh, historical corporate, corporate culture is um, steered away from that territory. Like I remember being coached as a leader at one point, and this is not recently, but uh, that I shouldn't use the word feeling um, because, uh, you know, that like communicated weakness or something, you know, and I look back on it now and I'm like, you know, because I'm very much in the midst of, you know, uh, um, I, I mean, I get, I get where that came from in a way, but I, but I have, I'm very much in the midst of, you know, um, serving the people uh, f yeah. with whom I work, for whom I work as a, as a leader. And I can't imagine trying not to touch on how they really feel, right? Because it just is so integral to what they uh, are, are able to do and achieve, yeah. you know? Yeah, well, it's interesting, right? Because you're also speaking, I think, to somewhat of an outdated way that we've looked at workforce culture, right? And I was just talking to one of my clients, I was doing like a big conference call for their employees. And I was saying that in the past, we've been told talking about things like race is taboo. But the origin of the word taboo is actually a Polynesian word, word called tapu, which means to talk about the sacred or the really important. Mm. And so the way that I've like used that with my executives that I work with is 
it's not necessarily taboo. It's taboo. It's sacred. So let's get into the mindset to have that conversation. Let's get into the commitment to the important conversation. Because I think now in the way that we're all moving in the world, the way we're connected, but also the way consumers are changing. I mean, there is no doubt that the buttoned up like wall between a brand and a consumer, it just doesn't exist anymore. You know, we're able to as consumers easily Google and figure out who's on your board, who's in your C-suite, who's on your executive teams, you know, what you pay, how you hire. I mean, we've opened up a lot of information. And I feel like because of that, we have a different relationship now to be in, which requires us to be feeling more transparent, more vulnerable. I also think the Generation Z workforce is demanding it. I mean, they will demand it. They already do. They're wired very differently than millennials, and they will want a space that they can show up fully, and that includes feeling things. (laughs) Hey, as long as you touched on that, with Gen Z, how have you, you obviously started your career in a place where you were really focused on young people prior to their, and they were probably at that point millennials, right? But um, how have you um, developed a, uh, a foothold in uh, Gen Z expertise? And how do you think about, um, because I bet there are a lot of our audience who are not in Gen Z, but are very focused on Gen Z at this point. Um, what would you advise them to do to be um, authentic in that space? Yeah, well, I think a lot of parents or a lot of uh, executives I talk to are parents of Gen Zers, right, which are pretty much like 10 to 24 years old, roughly. And then we look at Gen Alpha. So if you've got younger kids at home, we've gone through the alphabet, we're starting back at Alpha, but um, but they're zero to 10, right? So, so there's a couple of ways that we stay connected. I mean, I'm constantly talking in real time, both in formal discussion groups and ethnographies, but also I still speak and I go across the country when we were able to travel and I do a lot of... Um, kind of road work where I'm looking at and talking to different communities and different leaderships and different school systems and just trying to stay with one foot in the non-advertising world, non-marketing world so that I I know of what I speak. And then I think the other thing is just really watching, you know, trends are cyclical. We know that we'll see them change with generations. And you and I, I think are in Gen X and you're Gen Xer, right? I am a Gen Xer, yeah. Okay, so we're actually very similar to Gen Z in in certain ways. And so what I would say for parents or people who are raising Gen Zs or people who are wanting to market and advertise to them, there's kind of like three big things for us that we're working with on clients. I think number one is like you mentioned value earlier. Um, Sometimes they'll call it values. Other times they'll just call it kind of like who they are and what they believe in, but their beliefs and values are paramount to how they form relationships, how they form brand Um, equity relationships, and they're notoriously pretty fickle for brands who don't have a very strong core value that that feels authentic to them. I think the second thing is collaboration. This generation is so deeply collaborative because they have so many tools to do so. So their walls, their silos of how they look at communities is very, very different, right? With a, you know, they're the first true post-digital generation. Millennials can kind of split the difference between when they were born and whether they were digitally adapters. But Gen Z is like fully immersed in in kind of post-tech world. So they've grown up in this space. So collaboration is really important. And then The third thing that I think is going to help us all is that Gen Z is super dug into wellness. They recognize they're the most anxious generation. They're the most depressed generation. They're the most generation, the generation most likely to be on antidepressants right now at a young age, 10 to 24. So talking about feelings, these kids are all about feelings. I think you're raising some of these kids, aren't you, Matt? Oh, yeah. I've got a four-year-old. Well, actually, the four-year-old is alpha, but I've got a 17-year-old as well. Yeah. sounding familiar to you a little bit? Oh, definitely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's funny. uh, The second, the middle point that you made about uh, collaboration um, in my wearing my other hat, not as a show host, but as a, uh, you know, an advertising and marketing uh, creative leader. One of the things we think about in terms of making uh, assets for uh, Gen Z campaigns is not, is in in a sense, not finishing them. Not using platforms where Gen Z can collaborate with us on the actual creation of user generated content or, you know, an interactive campaign that evolves out of feedback from the from the community of fans, you know, um, is it's literally changing the, the mediums and through which we work in advertising and marketing. I think so, too. And I get excited because I think this generation is going to be wonderful, creative executors um, because they've they've 
really honed their skills at such young ages and all of these different um, apps and, and digital platforms. But collaboration is also key to their going back to like mental wellness and well-being. They are um, more connected, more empathic, and I think more in need of community than other generations, partially because some of their community is through a screen like this. So, you know, this is, and their whole world is being turned obviously upside down right now because of what's happening in COVID. And, um, but I think those are the markers of this generation that I think are going to be excellent in the workforce, but they're going to demand us to behave differently. No longer can we like not talk about feelings. I mean, we have to talk about feelings with appropriate boundaries, but if you're not leading from a heart placed you know, point of view, if you're not able to really be empathetic to others and what they're going through, this generation in some ways wants nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about uh, you as an artist, you as an activist, you as a uh, um, advocate for, um, you know, uh, uh, talking about uh, women's rights and body change and Black Lives Matter. And um, then now, today, we're seeing you about to launch a brand new podcast. So tell me yeah. about that and how does it connect to the rest of it or how'd you get there? I think it's an evolution of who I am as a person. It's not a marketing or advertising podcast. I did that once in 2017. I had a wonderful podcast where I talked to these amazing change makers that were disrupting their industries. And I love that. That was very on brand for me then. And it wouldn't probably make sense for me to keep doing it now, but there was something else really calling to me as I entered the middle passage of my life. And um, I've, experienced some loss in my life. I've lost loved ones and friends um, prematurely in their lives. And so the notion of death and dying and life and living has been looming very large for me. Um, this is well before we were on lockdown for COVID and facing some of these larger global health issues. So like last year, I decided that I was going to build myself a little podcast studio. And just for fun, in addition to all these other campaigns I was working on, I was going to start to talk to people about life, death, and everything in between. But I wanted to talk specifically about what was making a good life for people. Like, how were people designing a life that worked for them? What were the values that were important? What was their relationship with success? Certainly, what's their thought about dying? And mostly, what's their thought about living? Because these were the big questions that were keeping me up at night. And so, you know, it's somewhat taboo to talk about death. It's not something we normalize in this culture. People are really scared of it. In fact, we might argue it's the one thing we're all afraid of is dying. And so I wanted to lean way into that. So the show is called We're All Gonna Die Anyway. And it is actually quite joyful podcast. I love talking to people about important deaths in their life, the way they feel about death, but mostly it comes up what they love and how they live and how they create families and their work and lessons that they've learned. Because you can't talk about the end without actually talking about what you're doing in the middle, right? Like we're all born, we're all gonna die. But what we do in this middle part of our life and that dash on the tombstone is like what our lives are about. And I think for those of us, I don't know if you can relate with this, I have a hunch you would, you know, high achievers, creative leaders, people who have been recognized for their success or have been motivated by their ambition, all of that is fantastic, but none of that is what we take when we die, right? What we leave when we leave the earth is legacy and relationship and love. And, and so I, I wanted to balance that for me because that's something that I was exploring. And so I've had about 25 incredible conversations with from celebrities to grassroots leaders to business leaders, but none of it has been about their work. It's all been about their life journey um, and what they're learning and what they're most afraid of. So we've we've really gone there in ways I feel deeply um, I feel deeply grateful for. And so we're we're launching it July twenty third. Um, and I'm excited and I'm terrified because it's a it's it's more of me than I've shared publicly before. And do you think of it as a career move or is this more of a personal move for Jess? I, I, I think it's a career move and a personal move because my everything we've just talked about, if I reflect on it, my career has been personal. It's matched mm. and married to every part of my life and every age and stage I've gone through. And I think where I'm at now with some of the success that I've enjoyed and I feel very proud of, I'm also looking at what's next, what matters. I think certainly in the world right now where we're looking at racial violence and systemic racism and the systems that have oppressed us and other people, I'm looking at um, 
how do I make the most difference? And, and so it doesn't replace what I'm doing, but I think it's going to be additive to it. And yeah, I'll see how it goes, but I have a feeling that I'll want to do something more formal with it and, and bake it into my career, just like I've baked in the other things that I've been drawn to. So you've naturally shared a lot of insights with us over the course of this chat. Um, and I think we've discovered some together, which is always my favorite part. Uh, and then uh, I guess my last question for you would be, um, as you think of uh, young yous out there uh, kind of getting started on their career and thinking about how to chart a course, whether it's an entrepreneurial one like yours or inside of bigger businesses like some of the clients you've worked for. Do you have any overriding advice about, um, you know, uh, what we called out as the topic of the show, which was uh, knowing when to shift culture and when to let culture shift you? It's actually a really interesting question because I have taught for the last eight years at USC and I teach graduates and um, upperclassmen uh, in personal branding and entrepreneurship. So it's really about getting them to think about how they're going to enter the workforce. Exactly this question, like how do you show up being who you are, bringing who you are to your work, but also figuring out how to innovate and change. And because that's what this generation wants to do, whether they're an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, right? Whether they're going to go work for a business and innovate from the inside or whether they want to make a new industry or create something new. I always say, and it just goes back to our theme in, in this conversation, what is your what is your why? I call it a vision, values, and mission exercise, and I do it within the first week of class. And so I ask them to answer three questions. What's the 30,000-foot view of your life that gets you out of bed in the morning? Meaning, like, what's that big dream? What's that big vision that you put, you know, if you're able to, you put your feet on the floor and you like get up for the day thinking about that or being motivated by that. The second question is what are three non-negotiable values for you in your life right now? And that's really a tricky question to answer because most young people have values that they've adapted from other places, from their parents, from their school, from their friends. But to really think about what's non-negotiable for you, what's so important, bottom line, you wouldn't change who you were if somebody asked you to betray those values. And then the third question, it really is more about what step, just one step, could you do today to get you closer to that vision? <laughs> and I do it like a martini glass approach. I go pretty wide and then I narrow it down because I feel like if somebody were to do that before they did a job interview, when they started their job, when they go in to ask for a raise or a promotion, you can speak confidently from what's important to you and then learn how to match that to your business or to the job that you want. But you can't only think about your your lane, right? That I always try to tell my students, like, know who you are and then figure out how that matches into the workplace that you want to be in and be bold about that, be specific about that. Um, because I feel like then you get into a relationship, you know, much like I've done in my work with clients and brands. It's not just about what I want. It's about what we can create together. But I have to know who I am to listen to who they are and then kind of come together. And that's what I would say to people going into any field right now, if they're going to start something or join something, know who you are, but then know what value you would bring to that group or organization. Wow. That is so powerful. That's definitely something that I'm going to hang on to now for the rest of my life. And thank you for, for giving that gift. Uh, we're all going to die anyway, right? So thank you so much for, uh, for coming, for taking one of your precious days and, and coming on to this show. And, uh, and I, uh, I'm really grateful to you. It's so great to be connected to you again. And I think you've, uh, together, we've, we've really landed on a, a lot of really, um, wonderful insights uh, for pr people seeking to make a career as successful as you are. So Jess Wiener, uh, we're all going to die anyway, July 23rd. Where do we find it? Uh, it's on any place you're going to get your podcast, iTunes and beyond. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for being with us, Thanks, Matt. If you liked what you heard on this episode of Listen In, please drop us a note at listenin at eisenberg.com. Share your insights and let us know if you'd like to be a guest on the show. You'll always find the full version of each episode of Listen In here on A-List. And please always think who you know that might benefit by these insights and share this episode with them. And don't forget, please like us before you go. Till next week on Listen In, keep your ears on.